Hey everyone, today we are talking about functions. Function should be a vocabulary word you put into your notebook. A function is a special type of equation or rule that shows the relationship between two variables. But the special case is that there has to be exactly one y value or output for each x value or input. So, so far we've dealt with x's and y's, but we haven't necessarily given them special roles. In a function, the x is always the input, something we put into the function, kind of like a cause to something else's effect. And then the y value we assign as the output. So that's the thing that comes out, the value that comes out from your rule. So I like to think about a vending machine as a function because a working or a functioning vending machine uh, operates like a mathematical function. So if you look at this vending machine, um, you're familiar with how a vending machine works. You put in your money and the input you actually uh, insert into the machine is whatever buttons you press on the vending machine. That's actually telling the machine some information like I want a Pepsi. Okay, so that's the input data. Depending on what button you press, you're going to supposedly get the correct output or Y value. So in a functioning vending machine, um, whatever button you press should get you the correct output. And there should only be one Y value, one output. A non-working or not functional vending machine, well, maybe when you press Pepsi, um, sometimes you'll get a Pepsi, other times you'll get a water or a Sprite. Okay, so it has to be predictable. That's what makes a function good. It's gotta be predictable and it's gotta have one output or Y value. So let's take a look at some examples of a function versus not a function. Something that looks like a function but actually isn't a function. Right, so let's take a look at these two tables. Remember that X is the input, Y is the output. So if we look at this first table, we will notice that when we, for instance, input negative three, we will get the output of six. Now it doesn't have to be matching. We're just seeing that this is the input, this is the output. You'll probably notice that you have an input of zero and you get an output of eight. And look at over here, you have an input of negative 10 and you get an output of eight. So this kind of sets alarm bells in my head. I'm thinking, huh, that's interesting. Is, does that make that a function or not? Well, it actually does. So if you think of this as a vending machine, it's actually just a really efficient vending machine. It's doing a great job because it's preparing for disaster. It's thinking, well, what if eight, that soda, for instance, is very popular? Do I have a backup? Yes, I have a backup button. Sometimes somebody can press the zero button to get that soda. And other times, if let's say that um, soda is out, they can also press the negative 10 button to also get that same soda. So it's just being very efficient. So that is a function. Now here is a table that has the reverse. So you see that we have negative two as an input to get six. And we have a negative to the same input with a different output. It's the opposite. For this function, it's this different input that can get you the same output to be efficient. Here we have the same input that gets you a different output. This vending machine is no good. It's not a function because it's not predictable. Sometimes when I press the negative two button, I get a six. Other times when I press a negative two button, I get a 20. Well, what if I didn't want that, I wanted the six instead. It's very unpredictable, it's not reliable. This is not a function. So you can't have uh, different outputs for the same input. 
It has to just have one single output. It's got to be functional, reliable. Okay, the other thing that we should know about functions is that functions can be represented in many different ways by a table of values, ordered pairs, a graph, or an equation. So we're going to deep dive into an example from the book where we will be asked to do all of that to create a table of values, then order pairs to uh, graph it on a coordinate plane, and then create an equation. So in this situation, it says the initial temperature of some water in a kettle is 20 degrees Celsius. Upon heating, the temperature of the water increases by 10 degrees Celsius per minute, right? Because it's getting heated, so the longer you put the water under the heat, um, it's going to get hotter. Let Y degrees Celsius be the temperature of the water after X minutes. So notice how they're saying it's the temperature after a certain amount of time. So that also is an indication to you that we have an input and an output. So the input, the X, is going to cause an outcome of Y. The longer I put my kettle over the heat, it's going to get hotter. The initial temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. Let me just scooch this down so I have more room. So again, input of x, the minutes, is going to change the output, the temperature. Okay, so the initial temperature was 20 degrees Celsius. Um, they are skipping 1, 3, 5, and 7, so we will have to skip as well. After one minute though, it is 10 degrees uh, hotter, so it'll be 30, and then 40, and so on, 50, 60, right? So when we're filling out this table, after two minutes, it would be 40 degrees Celsius. After four minutes, 60 degrees Celsius. Six minutes, 80 degrees Celsius. Eight minutes, 100 degrees Celsius. So just like that, we filled out the table using the information they told us, started off with 20 degrees Celsius, and then after each minute goes up 10 degrees. So after two minutes, be going up 20, after four minutes, going up another 20, and so on. So we completed the table. Now we need to draw a graph of y against x for all values of x that are greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to eight. So here is some graph paper for me. And my x-axis will always be going across, so on the bottom here, which is my minutes. And then my y-axis is going up and down, so this is my temperature. And zero uh, in this corner here to start off. Let me go by twos, two, four, six, and eight. Just put little dots there so you know what it lines up with. That's for my minutes. And then I have temperature, let me go by tens. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and this up here would be 120, okay? That's temperatures in degrees Celsius. Okay, so I labeled my axes, I labeled my numbers on the side, my scale, and then now I have to change these into ordered pairs, okay? I'm going to write them on the side here, okay? X always goes first. By writing order pairs, it'll make it easier for me to graph later. So my first order pair is 0 and 20. Second is 2 and 40. Third order pair is 4 and 60. Then 6 and 80. And 8 and 100. 
Okay, so then I have to find my x first. My first is 0, 20, right here, where my 0 for my x lines up with my 20 for my y. Then 2 and 40, uh, 4 and 60, 6 and 80, 6 first on the x, and then 80 for my y. And then 8 and 100. Then um, I always want to use a straight edge and connect my points. And then I want to draw an arrow because I need to show that this line goes on forever. Okay, the benefits of drawing a graph is then later on I can you know, see where maybe three would line up with. Three lines up with 50 degrees Celsius and such. Well, with a table, I would have to fill it all out, right? But the line going on again, uh, forever, would, if, if my graph paper went on as well, I would be able to look up something really quickly. Okay, so there's my table, my graph, my ordered pairs. And now I need to express y as a function of x. Now what that means is they just want an equation, okay? That's all that is, an equation. So we need to figure out how x and y are related to each other. Well, y was the output, so y is going to depend on what's going on with x. So let me set y equals to as my first part of my um, equation because again, y is the output, so it's dependent on my uh, input, which is x. All right, let's see. Well, when my y, when my x is zero, my y is 20. So I have a starting point of 20. That means that that definitely is going to go in my equation, because it's a starting point, right? It's it's going to um, be present later on in all my values because they all had to start at at least 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, so I have now for x equals two, I had my starting point of 20 and I basically added another 20 to get there. Okay, let me write this sideways so I can get more room here. So I had my starting point of 20, and I basically added 20. When x equals 4, I had my starting point of 20, and I added 40 to it, 20 plus 40 to get to 60. For x equals 6, I had my starting point of 20, and I basically added 60 to it to get to 80. When x equals 8, I had a starting point of 20, and I added 80 to it. Okay. And if I wanted to fill this one out, it would be 20 plus 0 to get to this 20. So my equation is 20 plus something else. So let's see how x is related to the second part then. Okay. So I have changed to a different color. I have, oh, hey, look at that. The 0 here match with the 0 over there. Okay. How does this 2 match with this 20 over here? This x value of 4 match with this, or get to this 40 over here? How does the 6 match with the 60 over here? How does the 8 match with the 80 over here? Well, let's see. 2, when my x is equal to 2, 2 times 10 gets me to 20. When my x equals to 4, 4 times 10 also gets me to 40. 6 times 10 gets me to 60. 8 times 10 gets me to 80. So it looks like I always take my x value, whatever it is, and multiply by 10, right? When, I mean, when my x is 0, 0 multiplied by 10 is just 0, so it didn't really matter there. But for everything else, it looks like we just um, took our x value and we multiplied by 10, which, again, makes sense. Because if you look at the words in the problem, it said it increased by 10 uh, degrees Celsius per minute. So whenever something is happening each time, 
you're timesing it, right? You're multiplying by it. So again, starting point always has to be added, right? And then this multiply by 10 is occurring because it's increasing by 10 degrees per minute. 10 degrees Celsius each minute. So that's why we're going to multiply it. There we go. So if I were to give you x equals, I don't know, 20, then you would just take the 10, multiply by 20, and add another 20 to get your answer. I can plug in any value for x um, to then figure out what my y value is. And I can predict what's going to happen because functions are all about being predictable, being able to kind of tell the future, figure out the pattern of what's going on between x and y.